Okay, good afternoon. Obviously, uh, the bow tie struck a chord with you, and uh, for most of you, not because of the fashion reason, um, but for hopefully what we're going to talk about today, which is the application of the bow tie principle to risk management. And I guess when we were thinking about what do we talk about for this second ProTech technical lunch, um, it was thinking, do we go really technical? As in, if it's going to be technical, we really ought to kind of blow your minds, and probably ours as well. And then I thought a little bit further and thought, well, one of the big impediments we often find to really good risk management is getting the basics right. And in many ways, a lot of people struggle with actually what risk is. And you talk to anybody in the street and ask them what risk is, they'll have an answer. And it's often quite confused. Their educators have been mum and dad since they were knee-high to a grasshopper. It's been the media pushing risk stories and fear down their throats. And they get quite a distorted view of risk. And this is often an underlying problem with doing good risk management, because how can you do good risk management if you don't actually understand what risk is in the first place? So what the bow tie principle is all about is really understanding what risk is. So what I plan to do over the next 25 minutes is go through a more technical approach to bow tie analysis. And then when I've finished um, and you've done your uh, work that you have to do, because there's no such thing as a free lunch, so you have to do this exercise, I'm going to hand over to Henry, who's going to look at a practical application of the bow tie principle. And uh, then hopefully that will generate some discussion from you once we get to networking. So my starting point was to think about how we often portray the wonderful beast called risk. Those of you that use a simple five by five matrix, a, a traffic light report, will often represent the risk as a dot. And that's it. We say there's risk and got all our risks and so on. But to belittle it as a dot, I think, is really underestimating what risk is all about. So what I want to do is drill down into that dot and have a look at what risk truly is. And the way I want to do that is to tell you a story. And you can read it as well. And this is just a fictitious story of a train derailment at night, left a number of passengers with serious injuries and caused substantial damage to the train. The train derailed because of rocks that had fallen on the track. The train driver did not see the rocks as one train headlight was faulty and the driver was excessively tired from an 11-hour shift due to lack of drivers as a larger uh, number than normal people were sick with the flu. The steepness of the embankment meant that the injuries were higher as the train rolled down the embankment. The accident was reported in the press and the company's reputation suffered. The rail company was also subject to regulatory fines. Many passengers successfully sued for compensation, and in the ensuing six months, train passengers' numbers fell markedly. The end. Now that is actually the dot. And you can see why that a little dot belittles it somewhat. So what I want to do is, from that, take out the three main components of that story, which we all refer to as cause, event, and impact. And we often, uh, I often visualise that as dominoes. The first domino to fall is the cause, the start of everything. All the uh, interim dominoes fall, the events, and the final domino or dominoes fall being the impact. And that's the first expansion of the dot into those three elements. So what I want to do now is go back to that story and see if we can identify what the various causes, events, and impacts are. Number one, what were the causes? I would suggest to you it was at night, made visibility more hard. Rocks that fell out of the cliff, a headlight that was faulty, sickness of train drivers, and steepness of the embankment. There are five causes there which then come together to call a, a cause a disaster. We often call those uh, lining the holes in the Swiss cheese. And if you have got no idea what I'm talking about, I have a picture of a Swiss cheese later to put it into perspective. The second one is the risk events. These are the interim things that then happen once the causes have occurred. I would put to you that's the trail derailment, derailment the driver not seeing the rocks, the driver being excessively tired, having to do 11 hour shift, a lack of drivers, and the train rolling down the embankment, and finally the story being reported in the press. These are all the interim dominoes that fall. And we then come to the final dominoes, which are the impacts. I'd put to you that they are serious injury of passengers, damage to the train, reputation damage, regulatory fines, compensation paid, and passenger numbers falling, which means opportunity loss for future business. And if we do that, we're now getting to the bottom of what this dot really is. But it's a bit messy done in that way. 
So I'm just going to take that now and put it into a nice little diagram. We're going to start in the middle, <coughs> excuse me, with what we call the main risk event. And I'm going to call that the derailment. Usually when we know we've got that, it's the first thing you notice. If that was a press report in the newspaper, it most likely would be reported as train derailed. And that is the centre of what we're, the story we're just about to create. We then go backwards toward why did that happen? We ask the question, but why? Number one would be rocks falling onto the track. Two, the rocks were not seen by the driver. Three, the driver was fatigued. It was also at night. There was a faulty headlight. 11 hour shift made the driver fatigued. That was because of lack of drivers. And that was ultimately because employees were sick. I would put to you then that the four causes are down the left hand side. And those events then brought us to the central event of the, the train derailing. We then go towards the right and ask what happens next. The train rolled. That was also impacted by there being a steep embankment. It was reported in the press. There was a regulatory breach. And the impacts were passenger injury, compensation paid, train damage, reputation damage, and reduced revenue, and finally fines. Now that hopefully is a little bit easier to comprehend rather than that prose that I had on the previous slide. And there's no surprise what shape that creates the bow tie. <laughs> now that then leads us to what today's session is all about, and that is using the bow tie as a way of understanding what that little dot called risk is. So we have a much better comprehension of the risks we are facing, rather than calling them something as simple as a train derailment, or a keying error, or an error in a report, which is really underestimating our understanding of what risk needs to be. So if we think about that a little bit further, we need to think about how do we construct the bow tie. Well, the steps you should go through is number one, identify the main event. Now the main event is really up to you what you call that. I often feel it's the first thing you notice when that event, that, when that incident was to occur. And for us, as I said in this story, it's the, right, the tra train derailment. We call that the main event. You then might work towards the left by asking the question, but why, but why, but why, but why? And you only stop and, uh, when one of two things happens. Either the answer to the word but why is it just is. It just is. There is no answer. Or secondly, the answer is outside of your influence, which means it's been caused or been created by something external to the environment. I'll give you some examples later. What example would be rocks. Rocks falling off an embankment will be an external issue that you couldn't directly influence. You might protect yourself, as we'll see later, with a rock guard, but you couldn't actually stop the rocks from falling. You'd have to put up with that in the environment. We then move to the right hand side, once you've got there by the way, you're at the cause or the causes. You then go to the right by asking, but what then, but what then, but what then? And you only stop when one or more of your objectives of the activity you are risk assessing has been impacted. ISO 31000 says risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And all risk management must start with objectives, and we need objectives to do the bow tie, because if you don't know what your objectives are, you don't know when to stop. And that then finds the right-hand side of the bow tie being the risk impacts. If you look back at that previous story, I'm sure that the rail company would have protection of reputation, profitability, passenger safety as some of their objectives. And each one of those is therefore an impact when this derailment occurs. Number four. This bow tie that we've created at this point is an inherent risk bow tie, which means it has not yet considered controls. We'll add controls on later. So this is without controls. Now, common errors in constructing the bow tie, if you haven't had a go at this already. Number one is you do not ask, but why enough? You stop too early, and actually one of your events you say is your cause, and you've completely missed the root cause of the, uh, uh, of the risk. And as you'll see later, that's going to cause you a real problem when you try and um, um, uh, devise or put together a really good set of controls because you need to get back to the root cause. So with this, I always advise people to be childlike. Why? Because my five and seven year old, they know how to ask, but why? But why? But why? Josh, it just is. Yes, Dad, but why is it just is? And then you head for the scotch. <laughs> The second common error we have is that you miss out the interim steps. 
So rather than joining up all the boxes, you do a quantum leap from one event to another and miss out what happened in the middle. Don't, because you might miss some really important information. My advice to you is be childlike. When I read my six-year-old a story and it's late at night and she should be in bed, I take chapter one and I skip to chapter four. Problem is she's become so smart, she says, yes, Dad, what about chapter two and three where the princess gets rescued from the castle? Now, she's very good at creating bow ties because she will not miss out one of those boxes. She'll have everyone in there. So make sure that your boxes all tie up and the pathway through cause, event, impact is fully understandable and complete. The third one is a very common problem when in the initial bow tie, you actually state the cause as being a poor or weak or failed control. So when you get a bow tie initially and you go, the cause of that was lack of training, that's wrong. It's not the lack of training. The cause is human error. The control is training and you're saying it's not very good. That comes later. So try and avoid saying poor or weak controls are a cause. They are not. They are a poor control over some other cause or risk that you are trying to deal with. Now in constructing the bow tie, we need some assistance. So we know that we've got causes, events and impacts. Now most um, risk management methodologies create libraries and standard libraries that you can then source each element of the bow tie from. So you'll commonly have cause libraries such things as people, processes, systems, external events. You will have event libraries, which can be obviously very extensive, things like IT failure, fraud, and so on. And you can have then impact libraries, which are generally much, much smaller, seven or eight items, which represent the objectives of your organization or the business area that you are assessing. Now, once we've created those, it makes life a little bit easier to actually then create the bow tie. I'm sure most of you have those. Now, the next issue is how do we use or how do we look at the bow tie? It can be used for potential risks that have not yet happened. And that will then create many path combinations, many causes, many events, and many impacts. When an incident actually occurs, it can also be used as an analysis of an actual incident. This is where we trace a path through the bow tie of actually what happened. And we often call this root cause analysis and something similar in terms of analysing an incident of exactly what happened. Now, therefore, as we'll see later, we can use this in a number of different ways, which we'll touch upon in a few minutes. So we've now got our bow tie in all its glory. Now we start thinking about control separately, and we now add on our key controls through that process, and we link them to the right spot in the bow tie. Here's some examples. Number one, flu jabs. Number two, maintenance inspections. Three, inspections in terms of rocks. Number four is rock guards. Five, support drivers. Six, guard rails for the train on embankments. Seven is shift limits. Uh, eight is public relations. And number nine is insurance. Now, as you'll see there, I haven't just banded them in there. I've actually put them whereabouts in the bow tie do they operate. A little bit later, we're going to evaluate the relative effectiveness and cost of each of these types of controls. And the effectiveness grows dramatically the nearer the left-hand side of the bow tie the control operates. We call those preventive controls. Next, we have in the middle detective-type controls. And on the right-hand side, corrective, remedial, reactive-type controls. So I'll touch upon those in a minute but it's very important to actually articulate whereabouts in the bow tie the control operates and what pathway is it there to actually uh, manage. And I know Henry will touch upon that in a practical sense in his session. Now, if we think about the types of control, we therefore have three types of control. The first type operates towards the cause, and we call those preventative controls, trying to stop the bow tie beginning in the first place. Nipping in the bud, uh, prevention is better than a uh, 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 um, uh, solution. The next is, if a risk does occur, the next issue is detecting it, that it's in motion as soon as possible. And we through that, do that through detective controls. A smoke detector is a prime example of that. Finally, if we miss the detection of it and it finally goes to impact, we now need to focus on minimisation of impact, which we call corrective, remedial or reactive controls. 
Now, what's important about those controls is that those towards the left generally are the cheapest and the most effective. That is the preventative controls. You will not understand those unless you go back all the way to the root cause. The next cheapest, the next most effective of detective controls, and finally the most expect, so expensive and the least effective are corrective controls. Now I want to just give you a complete picture of risk. I've tried to expand the dot to the bow tie, now we're going to expand it one stage further and it goes like this. We are here today. A risk may or may not occur in the future and there is going to be a time period between now and when the bow tie begins, which is the time to cause. Once the cause occurs, we then have the bow tie, and then once we've got the impact felt, we're going to go into recovery mode, all the way to back, getting back to the original state. So we have really three zones here. Time to uh, cause, time to impact, and time to recovery. The bow tie sits there in the middle, once the cause has occurred. So it also re respect the fact you've got that time period before and after the bow tie. Once we've got that, we then need to think about adding controls on. Controls are right at the front, preventative, trying to stop a risk event, or sorry, a risk bow tie even commencing. Passwords on your IT systems and so on. Detective controls are to detect as soon as possible that a bow tie is in motion. We are therefore looking for symptoms, red flags, puffs of smoke that are given out as the risk bow tie gets underway. And we're trying to then identify it, jump on the problem and fix it before it ever gets to the impact end of the bow tie. If it does get to the impact end, we have then corrective controls and corrective controls are all about minimising impact. Now we do in 2013 a lot of work in relation to assessing the size of a risk and we generally use in most methodologies the relationship of likelihood and consequence. Now there's a lot of confusion about this and in workshops we get all sorts of things being said that are all out of line with each other. Why? The main reason is this, is that no one actually understands and appreciates what are we assessing the likelihood and consequence of. Well let's clear that up. It's the main risk event. It's the centre of the bow tie. Therefore, everything risk control that occurs prior to the bow tie is a reducer of likelihood of the risk event happening, the main event. Everything after is an impact reducer. And that then clarifies this whole use of the likelihood consequence matrix and so on. It's all to do with the main event. As a result of that, we can then say that preventative controls reduce likelihood, detective controls do both depending on whether they detect before or after the main event, and corrective controls reduce impact. Now those of you that were at the last technical lunch will remember we introduced the third dimension being risk velocity, because we believe that likelihood and consequence on its own is inadequate. I'm not going to repeat that, but I do want to highlight the application of velocity to the bow tie and it goes like this. We focused at the last lunch on velocity being the time between cause and impact. We believe that's only one element of velocity and we have re referred to that as TTI or time to impact. However, there is a period between now and when the cause will first occur, which because risk management has a lack of acronyms, we've added a few more. TTC, time to cause. We've then got time to impact from the period from risk cause to the risk impact, which is the time that the bow tie takes to travel. And finally, time to recovery, which is how long it takes you to recover the situation. Now, generally, we want to, um, uh, speed, or so we want to slow down time to cause and time to impact as much as possible and speed up time to recovery. So what I want to do now and which will then Henry will pick up as a practical application of uses of the bow tie. We believe the bow tie is the centre of risk management's universe. Everything attaches to the bow tie. What can we attach to it? Incident management, risk control self-assessment, scenario analysis, KRIs, compliance, and uh, finally reporting visualisation. I just want to give you an insight into each one of those, just so you can appreciate how practically we might use the bow tie. The first one then is incident management. When an incident occurs, 
It's a fantastic tool to an analyse what happened. Any of you that have watched air crash investigation will know exactly what I mean with a big whiteboard on the side of the hangar with all the bits of aircraft scattered around. They, I would suggest, are the best bow tie analyzers in the world, air crash investigators. Mine isn't quite as good, but I'll give it to you. So this is the creation then of the bow tie, which we just did earlier. Once we've done that, we then add on controls, and that becomes then our bow tie. What we can then do is analyze what went wrong. We obviously understand at this stage the causes from an inherent risk perspective. Now those inherent causes, we can't influence in the sense we can't stop them happening. There will be steep embankments, there will be rocks that fall off cliffs. What we can do, however, is manage that risk and we do that through our controls. So now what we would do is critique those controls and see where they are weak. First of all, we would look at existing controls and go maybe maintenance inspections were missed. Rock guards were broken, inspections were overdue, shift limits were breached we would then raise an issue and hopefully we then come up with a solution of a strengthening of those controls through actions. We also might come up with new controls, track inspections after inclement weather, perhaps. What this has then done is analyse the incident in a complete way and then come up with any issues that we've learnt from that incident, learning from our past mistakes and then hopefully coming up with a series of actions that will stop this risk happening again or certainly reduce the likelihood and or the impact of it happening again. Now that's the traditional way that we use bow ties and for those of you that don't use it for incident management you absolutely should. The next one is the risk control self-assessment and when you do an RCSA you generally put a risk in a risk library and for some of the RCSAs that we have viewed they go from woeful to fantastic. So the woeful one is the one that says the risk is weather. Fantastic. What on earth does that mean? We now need to get slightly more granular. So we now start seeing the detail of the weather. Hurricane caused by climatic conditions leading to damage to property. Now we're starting to get the bow tie principle. And because I've picked one cause, one event and one impact, we often call that the risk statement. And then we move to three, which is the bow tie, the main risk event multiple causes, multiple impacts, but we don't fill in the events in the middle. And then finally is the full-blown bow tie where you've got all the chapters of the book mapped out. Now in terms of the RCSA, your key risks, we would suggest you do the full-blown bow tie. For the minor risks, you might do just multiple causes, the event and multiple impacts without spending a huge amount of time on all the interim events, but that's your call. On top of that, you would then identify your key controls over that bow tie. And as you know, in RCSAs, we assess inherent risk, the effectiveness of controls, and then residual risk to create our wonderful traffic light type report. Number three, you can use it in scenario analysis. We often view scenario analysis that's done, worst case scenarios. And the person says, oh, a flood. And you go, how much is that going to cost you then? They go, oh, 60 million. So how does the 60 million arise? Oh, I don't know, sounds about right. Now that's kind of sticking a wet finger in the air, which to us is totally unacceptable. You need to map out the scenario that creates that worst case. Example, we might have a situation where we get not a rock fall, but a cliff collapse across 300 metres of line. This is worst case, by the way. You can still get on a train. That then creates trains that are crushed, and as you can see below, we've put the assumptions, two eight-car trains, it's in rush hour and they are at full capacity. So now we are putting the assumptions that create the scenario. That then leads to passenger death and injury. Compensation, $250 million, obviously an estimate. Train damage, $50 million. It's reported in the press. Share price drops, $150 million. Reduced revenue from passengers not getting on our trains anymore. Regulatory breach, which leads to fines of three million. We top that all up and we get 473 million. Now I know that's pie in the sky, but I would suggest to you that's a little bit more scientific than a wet finger in the air. You can at least now show the scenario that created 473 million and hopefully the management process has learnt something from going through the exercise. To me, the 473 million that if you are a bank you might use in capital, wonderful, that's not going to help management. It's the understanding of what really could happen in worst case scenarios. 
The next one is key risk indicators, which we as a firm are a huge fan of, anybody that uh, knows us and talk, talks to us about it. Key risk indicators, critical risk management function. The problem we often find with key risk indicators is we have work, we see workshops being done, everybody sits around and goes, what's our risk? And they go, oh, it's X, Y, Z. What's our indicators? Oh, I don't know. Hey, have a look at what we currently collect. Oh, the number of people that had cornflakes for breakfast. That sounds like a good one, let's collect that. We put it in a nice colour pie chart, report it, and it's completely meaningless in relation to the risk. So we now need a methodology that really truly identifies good key risk indicators, and I would suggest it's this. Put up the bow tie, and then start talking through the pathways. Once upon a time, there was an awful lot of rain. Ah, oh, there's a symptom, we can track rainfall. So what you're now looking for through the bow tie is what symptoms, red flag, puffs of smoke would exist as this risk develops and then put an indicator to track it. We've got therefore rainfall. Number two might be the average age of the headlights on the trains. Number three might be the level of flu in the general public. Number four might be number of drivers that you are short. Number five, staff overtime. Number six, number of regulatory issues that have been notified. Number seven, number of negative press articles. And number eight, the number of damage incidents that have occurred. Now what we're trying to do then is to put sensors into our bow tie so we pick it up as early as possible. And that's what KRIs are. Now if you do it that way, you can start now assessing the quality of the KRI in terms of, as we're seeing a second, leading or lagging, how far to the left or the right hand side of the, uh, boat of the um, risk event is it? Most people pick up lagging KRIs and then go, oh, they're not very good because the horse has already bolted. It's because they haven't mapped it to a bow tie to see that it is lagging and start getting their brain power focusing on the left-hand side of the bow tie. Now, we believe that KRIs track two things in risk. One is the flow of risk through the bow tie, and number two is the performance of controls. Now, you can, if you wish to have another acronym, call those KCIs, Key Control Indicators. Here's some examples. Number one, the number of staff that have had their flu jabs, the number of inspections that have been carried out, the number of shift limit breaches that have occurred, number four, the number of recoveries by insurance and cost. Now, that is then tracking the effectiveness of controls. The combination of those are a series of KRIs that you could therefore put in place to track that particular risk. Now you probably wouldn't track all of them, but you might pick up your top three and attach it to that risk. KRIs therefore track the flow of risk through the bow tie and the performance of controls. If we now add the concept of quality of KRIs, we focus heavily on whether a KRI is leading or lagging. Now, as a general rule, there are two main factors that create whether a KRI is leading or lagging. Number one, where is it in the bow tie? If it's towards the left-hand side, the cause, it's generally leading. If it's towards the right-hand side of the bow tie, it's generally lagging. And the other factor is whether a KRI, whether a, a, a risk is fast velocity or slow. If you've got a slow, a slow velocity risk, Generally, you've got lots of time from the indicator going off to stopping the risk or, or stopping the risk in its track tracks. If you've got a fast velocity KRI, generally by the time you've done anything, it's all too late and you have a lagging KRI. Why am I telling you all of this? To try and illustrate the power of the bow tie in really assessing whether your KRIs are quality or not. For those of you that don't, I'd strongly suggest you map your KRIs to the bow tie and then critique their quality. Number five is compliance. We often see that a lot of compliance people often get told to do it because we told you to, and they have no idea why the compliance breach is a problem. The bow tie is a great way of illustrating why it is a problem. Breach of regulation caused by unaware uh, or uh, lack of awareness of the requirements. Lack of update of the compliance library due to resource constraints being fed by budgetary constraints. Also human error. As a result of that, that then leads to regulator being notified, fines being suffered, loss of license reported in the press, and reputation damage. Now if you hand that to a compliance person and say we think you should make sure you comply, they're much more likely to do it because they know the repercussions of not complying. So it just shows them what's upstream and what's downstream. So finally, we've now got the bow tie. How do you apply it? You can apply it to anything. 
Ordinarily, we might apply it within a business unit within the organisation. And if we do that, we might have a bow tie that's in manufacturing. So for manufacturing, their causes are everything that comes into manufacturing from perhaps external organisation or another business unit. Equally, the risks that they create going out the other end might well go into another business unit, and we now get into connectivity between business units. So as a result, if we now put all the bow ties together, we've now got bow ties across multiple business units in a process chain. And now we've got the holes in the Swiss cheese. And each of those red dots is the cause of what's just about to happen. Off we go. All the risks occur. The holes in the Swiss cheese line up as an almighty bang, and we suffer an ultimate consequence out of the right-hand side of that particular risk event. And again, I could use that for any air crash investigation show because most of them are started by three, four, five causes that all come together to cause the aircraft to finally hit the ground. Now, what we've just done then is um, add multiple bow ties together to create the organisation-wide bow tie. So you've got to think about how you apply the bow tie internally and then create an end-to-end -end bow tie to truly get a picture of your top ten risks. So finally, visualisation. That's how we tend to show risk in 2013. So I haven't got a lot of rocket science for you here, but here's some ideas. The first thing you could do is educate your staff in the bow tie and how to use it, and then do that. So I know it's not that exciting, but at least, <laughs> at least it turns the dot into the bow tie. What I would suggest you then do with the appropriate IT capability is to have the ability to click on those bow ties and drill down. Now, for a key risk, of which you might have four or five, I would suggest the drill down might be that extensive, which is the full-blown bow tie. Okay? If it's a minor risk, you might just go cause event impact. And I would suggest most of you right now in your enterprise risk management software systems will probably identify causes, events and impacts, but not map them as a bow tie. They'll probably be in a form, a drop-down box, and not be very visual. The key to this is to understanding this and get, getting the understanding across your employees, and we suggest the bow tie is an easy way to do that. So to summarise the value of the bow tie, ease of understanding, getting your staff to understand in simple terms what risk really is. Why we have risks and controls. If people understand the bow tie and add their controls on, they can see very simply what happens when that control fails. It's a wonderful methodical analysis in terms of a mindset on how to analyse risk. You can appreciate the upstream and downstream impacts and effects. You can identify your key controls, understanding which ones affect the key pathways the most. You can use it to assess the quality and effectiveness of controls. You can use it to identify KRIs, document worst case scenarios, and report through visualisation. So finally, where to now? Do you understand how your key risks work? Do you understand their root causes? Do you understand how your controls work? Do you have trouble linking all those elements together? Do you have trouble getting staff to understand your risks and controls? Well, if you do, sorry, and lastly, do you have trouble communicating risk? Well, if you do, I'd suggest maybe you need to get formal and quite simply bow tie it. Amen. Oh, I don't say amen at the end of that. So <laughs> I say well tied. So thank you.